Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, Samsung's new 4TB SSD Peltier cooling is back. A $45 mechanical keyboard, and you still can't buy a GPU yet. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 372, recorded July 14th, 2016. Four terabyte SSDs and AMD for the win. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker. Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. Pair Tracker to your smartphone, attach it to any item, and find its precise location with the tap of a button. Visit the tracker.com right now and enter promo code TWITCH for 30% off your entire order. Welcome to Twitch, this week in computer hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most colorful, and today blurriest video from <laughs> California possible. <laughs> however, however, my man Ryan Shrout is looking crisp and delightful. Are you, sir, oh. on gigabit fiber? Uh, I am, but I, I have to say, it's only 250 megabits up. So it's not gigabit both directions. I'm uh, trust me, I'm as just as disappointed as you are. In um, theory, I've I've got considerably more uh, bandwidth than I actually have access to uh, right now. Comcast is giving us a whopping 1.5 megabits up. Ooh, um, sh should be uh, it's approximately 10 percent of what we should actually be getting. <laughs> we have five business class cable modems uh, aggregated, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the aggregation is pathetic. Um, Apparently. Yeah, our our pep link even started to cry. Um, <laughs> but uh, oh, I've never seen a pep link. It's a nice way to aggregate a whole bunch of internet devices into one network. So, cool. Yeah, just saying. Just saying. Oh, my goodness. Um, should we start or end the show with the uh, GPU update? <laughs> or, or should we just uh, say they're all still too expensive? Don't buy a GPU this week. I think we have to have one. They're all still expensive. They're all still hard to find. Um, I, I literally just sent an email to NVIDIA asking for, like, an official comment on that situation of how come, even though, like, so 1080s are, are, are way out of stock. They're really hard to find. So not finding one close to uh, the 599 price yeah. is more understandable. Uh, but there are a lot of 1070s in stock. We seem to see a lot of those throughout throughout the week now. Um, but we don't see any at that $379 expected I was say, MSRP. I was like, wait, you saw one at $379? I'm like, I saw one at $530. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's it's definitely better now. Um, let's see. Where is the 1070 on the now in stock .net list? 449, that, 449, um, 449. 449 oh, right so essentially they're matching the price of uh what the founders edition card is you can get a 439 for an evga card on new egg i'm seeing right now um so i don't know let me see what this other evga one is it's also 469 so the other the other direction um but but nothing listed in the threes there's nothing that starts with a three that i see on this pricing list even funny, you even know Pre-orders, they're 419. GeForce GTX 1070 Gaming Perfected. And mm. 449 on the GeForce.com website. Limit two per customer. That's that's the that's the expected price for that one, right? Because that's the okay. founder's edition. Um, but it's all these other ones, right? If you look at the at the uh on the GTX 1070, there's one that's listed at uh, where is this guy at? Um, it's listed at 419 on pre-order on Amazon. It's the 1070 Aero OC, uh -huh. right? It's the it's the lowest price I've seen for one period. Due in stock on July 17th, so that's just a few days from now. So that may be your best option if you're trying to get a 1070. Um, but this is a card that I would very much have expected to be the 379 price point, um, and we are not. It's not there. Like it's just. It's not, it's and funny it sucks, the, and I don't, on the, I don't like it. On the GTX website, they're actually listing, they're listing GTX 1080, 1070, and 1060, but they are not actually listing them as being Founders Edition, which I guess technically you have to assume they're, have they, 
Yes. NVIDIA wouldn't sell anything on their website, I don't think, that wasn't right. the Founders Edition. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, I think that's what that has to be. If I look at the 1080, I'm trying to right. click through to their site and I click buy now. Okay. If you, um, okay. If you, if you go, if you scroll far enough down, like halfway down the page, mm -hmm. it says the new GeForce GTX 1070 <clears throat> balances sleek angles and thermals for a cooler design, both inside and out. Learn more yeah. about the Founders Edition. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I, that's what I see as well. So the, they're listed huh. there, um, but that's, I mean, 699 is is fine. Like, I, I still think that's a, a competent, that's a, it's an okay price right. for the high-performance graphics card that it is. Um, but we were kind of promised 599, uh, and we don't have any of that, so. NVIDIA's got some money know. to sock away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't this know. True. I, I still, I, I still, I'm, I'll just say that I'm still frustrated with the entire Founders Edition concept. Like, let's let's charge you more. I, I don't know. You know, it's it's like the consumer electronics adopters curve from hell. Early adopters will pay a penalty for adopting early because we can't. Yeah. I mean, we already have an, enough early adopters tax as there is just in terms of you deal with any of the potential right. problems that are there, headaches, performance changes that scale with driver releases, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you would think they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily do that. But it's it's hard to make that argument from a business standpoint when they just keep selling the parts. Everything right. they make, they sell, essentially. So it's hard Maybe to they're say. they're only making six a week, man. <laughs> I Yeah. I, I have, so your, I don't have specific contacted. numbers, right. but nobody will tell me specific numbers, but I keep hearing that this is the highest, fastest ramp for any card of this class ever. Like they've sold okay. more than they've sold 980s. They sold more than they've sold 780s. They sold more than they've sold 680s in, the uh, in this amount of time. Of 980s or, or the initial sort of like. No, no, like in other words, run. the, the ramp is faster okay. on these. Okay. So you know, well, again, that still doesn't really help me in terms of a quantity, right. and it doesn't help people that are trying to find it. But you kind of go, okay, if they're doing that, why would they push their partners to lower prices? I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, the I just want I want the you know I want the Radeon 470 and 480 online. I want the 1060, the 1070, and the 1080 online. I want to. Yep. I I just I can't. I can't build my next gaming machine and I can't up my, update my graphics until this all settles itself out. I want to see 1060 benchmarks um, in any case. Because, yep. you know, I'm a, I'm a gamer of modest means and I, I'm, I'm not going to pay $300 for the GPU and I can get $400 worth of GPU performance for 250 because I'm cheap yep. that way. <laughs> cheap and not cheap. Oh, my goodness. Amazon Prime Day, by the way, uh, they apparently sold more goods in a single day than they ever have. I only bring this up uh, because the uh, Crucial, uh, that 750 gigabyte Crucial SSD that Alan loves so much and, and I keep circling, was available for a whopping $140 down from its regular $199 retail price. Uh, so next year, you might want to pay attention to the Prime, uh, the Prime sales because in some cases they are ridiculous, although in many cases they are crap. But I desperately want this drive uh, and my wife will beat me to death with a ball peen hammer should I spend this much money on a SSD right now. Um, <laughs> the 850 Evo 4 terabyte, two and a half inch SATA SSD review, Speedy Behemoth, which sounds like the best code name ever, um, or a really, really obscure X man or woman. Um, wow. So 48 layer VNAND, of course, um, you know, 48 layer VNAND is performing. Uh, at 32 layer VNAND uh, levels, which is a good thing. Um, this thing is huge. This is a four terabyte SSD. Uh, HDTAC transfer speeds are pretty much online with everything else in the Evo and the Pro lineup. Um, they're pretty much maxed out at this point. 476.9 uh, uh, reads, 458.3 on writes, which is like a shade behind the 850 Evo two terabytes. But I think if you hiccup, um, you'll probably notice more of a difference between those two at 458.3 and 459.8 on write speeds. Um, again, just as fast. Pretty much everything looks like it's saturated across all the Samsungs. Um, you know, the mm -hmm. MX300, that crucial is a little bit behind there. File copy tests look good. Um, how did the latency tests look? 
Latency tests look good. I mean, there was really not much changed um, from the 500 gigabyte drive or whatever to this four terabyte drive. It kind of didn't perform better, didn't perform worse. Uh, it was just kind of right in line with, with expectations. There was an interesting thing on that page. Actually, if you look at that right there, this is not, it's not specific to um, this drive, but it was a new testing methodology that we're working on that Alan's been putting together. Um, if you scroll down to the, uh, that, that image right there that you're looking at is what it looks like when a, uh, say you have a, um, a downloading application in the background, like BitTorrent or something like that, and you're downloading at about, 30 megabytes per second continuous according to the application. That's kind of what your traffic looks like. You see how there's like little peaks and valleys. The application right. is basically caching data and kind of writing it to your, your drive and bursts. Um, and we often get asked for storage performance like for real, real world scenarios. So if we go to, let's go down to the second graph there uh, or the second image there, you'll, what you'll see is um, a look at two different drives, OCZ Trion on the left, Samsung 850 Evo on the right. And what this new te testing methodology does is we are able to simulate a constant 30 megabytes per second of writes in the background. And then uh, the higher spikes that we're simulating there are uh, 200 megabytes of reads all at once, as if you were <laughs> starting up Photoshop or opening up a right. Chrome browser that had a bunch of tabs in it or something like that, right? Um, and so what we're measuring now is kind of like the impact of background activity on, um, uh, on, on kind of other types of activity. On the right, you see the 850 Evo 4 terabyte drive uh, that's focus of this review kind of has the higher spikes are those 200 meg reads. It's consistent. Um, on the left, the OCZ Trion, it's almost consistent, but you have two instances where it kind of spikes up to 100%. Um, and it, these are just some properties of the different caching mechanisms that these drives are using, et cetera. So we're, we're diving more into that. Um, so what happens is, what's, what's interesting is that if you scroll down to the graph that Alan put together, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see kind of active speed during bursts, right? So both in reads and writes, the blue bars being reads and the uh, orange bars being writes. Obviously higher is still better, uh, but this is kind of what your effective megabyte per second performance throughput would be on those reads and on those writes when the drive was doing them. Um, obviously, since you're right, it shows, you know, the top line shows we're writing at 198 megs per second, but if we're only actually writing 30 megabytes per second from, uh, you know, our torrent, that what that's what that's measuring is essentially the application caches it in RAM and then bursts it all to uh, the drive in um, small small doses, right? And so those small doses are essentially running at the 198 megs per second. Um, and so you can see, S, you know, SATA drives tend to be fairly consistent, fairly regular. But you know, you look at like something like the MX300, which is a new drive uh, that we actually had pretty good performance results with with our previous testing. But it, it shows there. Um, that it's actually quite a bit lower than the Evo drives uh, than um, uh, the uh, that SX930, which I think is a... Uh, I can't remember whose brand that is now, actually. Uh, but, but you can tell that the, like the MX300 is... Is, is lower. The the writes are actually affecting the read speed of it dramatically. Right. And then you can go down and look at the PCIe NVMe drives, the 950 Pro at the bottom, the Intel SSD 750, and see that they're way ahead of uh, of those writes. And then the next graph down, um, sorry to onslaught you with, with new data here, shows Don't like the it. read time, right? So this is for the total um, 10 iterations of 200 megs a piece, two, two gigs of data, while a background write is going. Uh, and this is maybe more indicative of, say you were opening up, you were loading up Doom and you were loading up your save right. game. It's probably going to read two gigabytes of, of textures and data into your system and into the graphics card, right? So this is indicative of that, right? And this, so this is based on time where lower is better. Right. Uh, and you can see the Evo 4 terabyte, 4.25 seconds, uh, whereas that MX300 is actually up to seven and a half seconds right. or so. So you can actually see what the potential real world difference is in the performance of these drives. And then people often ask us, hey, is an NVMe drive actually faster in real world usage? And we look at that and you see that it would be able to load that, that level of doom um, at, in 1.75 seconds as opposed to 4.5 seconds or so for a traditional 
SATA SSD. So there are gains to be found there. Um, and what's really cool is this testing method that we're working on will allow us to simulate a whole bunch of different things um, based on workloads. So nothing uh, specific about the 850 uh, Evo 4 mm -hmm. terabyte here stands out in that testing, but it was kind of just the first place we used it. Um, so we wanted to, to mention that at least. Did you see the it's price awesome. of this drive, by the way? Uh, last I looked at it, it was sixteen hundred dollars. It's fifteen. Well, the MSRP is fifteen hundred bucks. Right. It's dangerously <sighs> close to your goal of like sub twenty five cents a gigabyte. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's close. Ten cents a gigabyte. <laughs> I wanted ten cents a gigabyte. My my problem with this is that the four terabyte drive is not any less in cost per gigabyte than like the 500 gigabyte drive, which I don't really understand. Mm -hmm. um, you would think well, as the drives get bigger that the cost efficiency would, would spike to in a way that these would actually come down in price. Um, mm -hmm. But that's apparently not the case, at least, at least not initially. I don't think this drive actually goes on sale until a little bit later this month, but um I, you know, you'd be, yeah, I mean, at this point, they're taking pre-orders. I'll be curious to see what it sells for. And it might also, this also might mean that effectively all of the cost in, you know, it, it costs next to nothing to assemble and package an SSD mm -hmm. and that all of the cost is tied up to the physical memory. Um, yeah. So Maybe, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I'm still struck by like, you know, Alan's finally given us a set of tests where you can justify the additional expense of a 950 Pro or one of Intel's 750s. <laughs> just what you and your wife wanted to hear, right? Yeah, just what my wife wanted to hear. Yeah. Honey, I need a 950 Pro. I'll be more efficient. I'll be able to get home from the office earlier. Ryan, can Perfect. I come live in your house? <laughs> <laughs> I could be your manny. That's fine. Uh, you just got to move to Kentucky. Hey. You're welcome. Chris. You're a beautiful creature. If you are looking for an even larger and more Death Star-like uh, Darth Vader-influenced uh, cooler for your computer, we have it uh, for you. <laughs> Tim Perry wrote this up for PZ Burr. Phenonics Hex 2.0 Tech is CPU cooling alternative for SFF systems. Um, this is crazy. It's a heat sink, it's a tower air cooler, and a tech base plate. It's 125 millimeters tall. Uh, it's mini ITX friendly and claimed to be competitive with closed loop water coolers with up to 240 millimeter radi radiators. Um, that is a big claim. You also notice, if you take a look at the picture up on uh, the PC Per website, there is a big honking GPU power connector on the side uh, and a fan connector. Um, this is pretty interesting. What you're essentially looking at is a 92 millimeter fan uh, slapped between a pair of aluminum heat sinks with 40 fins each, uh, eight six millimeter heat pipes, Tim writes. And that's basically pulling the heat from the hot side of the thermoelectric cooler and dissipating the heat. The tech has a copper base plate. Um, and if you haven't like, you know, we, I don't think I've seen one of these and actively thought about putting it in a, in a machine uh, in over a decade. But essentially you have... Um, two to similar uh, conductors and electron, as you apply power to it or an electric current to it, um, electron transport pulls the heat from the cold side of the cooler to the hot side of the cooler. You may have heard that referred to as a Peltier cooler in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, then you cool off the hot side as fast as you can. Um, uh, reviews are posted around the net. Tweak Town says it does compete with 120 millimeter liquid cooler, such as the Silverstone Tundra TDO3 uh, and the Antec Cooler H2O 1250. Um, quote, when placed in insane mode and the fan is allowed to spin up to maximum RPMs, the Hex 2.0 thermoelectric cooler actually beats the 240 millimeter Corsair H100i GTX in quiet mode. While it will be louder, that's pretty impressive to see a 92 millimeter fan uh, up there in cooling performance with a much larger water cooler. It is not we cheap, though. No, 150 bucks. Uh, yeah. I got one of these in, and I, honestly, they sent me one before I even knew what it was. <laughs> and I remember I, I took it out of the box and I was like, why does this fan, why does this heat sink have a six pin PCI Express power connector on it? I really, I really didn't know. And it's not what really idiot big, engineered right? this. <laughs> yeah, like this is so stupid. Um, but it's really not large, right, in terms of in terms of modern heat sinks, right? And especially considering there's no fans on the outsides, the fan is actually in the middle. Um, it's it's a fairly compact design. It should fit in a lot of small form factor cases. Um 
and you got you have the six pin power connector it can draw up to 35 watts of power for the peltier cooler four pin for the fan pass through and it's got usb connection so you can actually can kind of uh control when it goes into the thermoelectric mode uh, in software if you want to do that or you can kind of let it all manage it on board i guess um okay. but it's 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 a really interesting design um that I'm hoping we get to test in the not too distant. Yeah, here we go. So this part comes off, and then you can see the fan is uh, sitting right in there. So, nice. yeah, it's 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 pretty nifty how it all how it all comes together. So, um, it is pricey, uh, but it's been so long since we've seen a a, a TEC a thermo cooler like a Peltier cooler like this that right. I was just curious to see what this this new company kind of coming out of nowhere to develop a cpu cooler would do they were they were at e3 of all places right that's where they were trying to set up a meeting with me and i was like okay i don't know why a cooler company would be going to e3 necessarily but i'll gladly uh talk to them and, and see what their product is like so uh it should be neat 150 bucks i'd wait for there are already some reviews out there but we'll have our own up uh relatively soon as well cool there you have it people it has potential and boy they put a lot of black anodizing on that. Yeah. Very stylish. Very distinctive. Mm -hmm. uh, Doom on Vulcan benchmarks. What's the word, man? So Doom, uh, when, when NVIDIA launched the 1080, they, they actually showed a Vulcan, a Vulcan version of Doom running. So this is the new Doom on the Vulcan API, which was kind of built out of Mantle. Uh, it is a low-level API from uh, Kronos Group, same guys that do OpenGL and OpenCL. This is, uh, it's not the first game to have Vulkan, but it's kind of the first major game to add Vulkan support. And the improvements over OpenGL will vary depending on what your hardware is, right? As it turns out, the AMD hardware gets a really big boost in performance. We're talking like really? 25 to 30% increase over wow. OpenGL, right? So uh, in that graph right there, they're showing you like, uh, it's a little bit hard to read because of the um, normalized scale. Um, but the Fury X goes from being 17% slower than the GTX 1070 to being 26% faster than the GTX 1070 after the use of Vulkan. Whoa. Uh, and that's significant, right? Um, in my yes. own testing, uh, I saw 28% jump in performance uh, on the RX 480 for example. And when you compare that to the 970, the it, it actually takes a card that was, you know, 10 frames per second slower and makes it 15 per uh, 15 frames per second faster than the GTX 970 or something like something of some it's it's a shift of that of that nature. Um, right. and the unfortunate thing for Nvidia is that they don't really see any perf benefits uh, moving from OpenGL to Vulkan. Um, it's unknown as to why um, there's there was some confusion out there about all oh, different AA modes disable asynchronous compute. We were we were when in my testing we were using uh, TSS AA, which is one of the modes that does allow asynchronous compute to work. Um, but I, I think the most likely answer, the simplest answer, that's often the, the correct one, is that. AMD built Mantle, AMD built GCN, their graphics architecture kind of around Mantle and Mantle around GCN. Um, and this is the fruits of that labor is um, Mantle turning into Vulkan produces this. And so they their drivers and architecture is fundamentally built for Vulkan uh, a little bit better. This doesn't mean AM, or that NVIDIA won't get better. Um, I just don't know when, I guess. Um, so it, it's not that, it, it's not like it hurts NVIDIA's performance, it does help it a couple of frames per second here or there, uh, but it's not the significant jumps that we're seeing on hardware. I mean, I've seen people on Reddit talking about uh, seeing R9 390 performance jump from, you know, jump by 50% or something like that in some settings and configurations, right? Like that's that's not just a, oh, here's 5 to 8% boost because you're switching a setting on. Um, mm -hmm. It's doing the same amount of work. It's rendering the same images, but you're getting a 50% bump on the same hardware just by... Uh, enabling Vulkan is is really substantial, um, and it, right. because AMD gets such a big advantage, you have to wonder why Nvidia does not get such a big advantage out of it. Well, if you're AMD, you point out that your extraordinary engineering talent has figured out a way to maximize the returns available through superior coding. Shame Nvidia doesn't have that. 
and they say it with a really <laughs> snarky voice, which is hard to detect because they're Canadian. Yeah, um, true. You know, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm always stunned at what some, some software tweaking can do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, also, on a completely random note, I want to point out that I didn't notice a question like, how come Bluetooth 5 and HDMI are working without hardware upgrades, but we always need new Ethernet cables? And I was like, well, most HDMI 1.4 whatever, you know, cables were actually built to the HDMI 2.0 spec, and there's just a whole bunch of wires they don't use uh, uh, for, you know, HDMI 1.4. Whether or not it'll handle the bandwidth, like the 18 gigabits you need uh, for HDMI 2.0 is another question, uh, and uh, really a, a question of the quality of the construction. But it's funny, there's a lot of confusion around Bluetooth 5.0 because it promises this huge increase in range and this huge increase in throughput. Um, it is not, you, you are not going to get the range or the throughput increase on your Bluetooth 4.0 device that you were holding in your hand today. It will be compatible mm. with Bluetooth 5.0, but only Bluetooth 5.0 hardware is going to uh, is going to get that performance uh, increase. Unless there's something the Bluetooth uh, uh, consortium has been telling people that they haven't told me yet. That, that, but as far as I know, you are not going to get the performance Bluetooth the, the Bluetooth 5.0 performance on Bluetooth 4.0 hardware. They'll just talk to each other. Uh, sorry, that was coming up on on tech thing this week, and I was like. D -d 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 that thing, it, it does not mean what you think it means. So, but Bluetooth 5 is looking pretty awesome. Also looking pretty awesome, being able to find your keys or your cat because you perhaps had a sleepless night. Uh, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Tracker. Smart car, smartphone, smart homes. Technology's made everything smart. But losing one's possessions can make smart people feel less than smart. I'll say it. I feel dumb when I can't find my keys which is why I'm religious about putting my keys in a dish on the dresser in the right place. That way my four-year-old can find them and randomly distribute them throughout the house without my knowledge. <laughs> which is why, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about Tracker, which makes losing things a thing of the past. Did I mention four-year-olds and keys? You can probably figure out that they end up in strange and unusual places. Mm -hmm. um, the Tracker is a coin-sized device that uh, locates misplaced keys, wallets, bags, computers, even pets in seconds. You pair the tracker to your smartphone, you attach it to any item, your keychain, your backpack, your cat, and you find its precise location with a tap of a button. It is really easy. You can customize two-way separation alerts to receive notifications before you forget your item. So if you get too far away from your backpack or if someone picks up your backpack and starts walking away from you, the alarm will go off. This is awesome. If you lose the phone, you can press the tracker button and your phone rings, even if it's on silent. This is also awesome. With over 1.5 million devices tracker it's crazy right they, they they basically said they have the largest crowd gps network in the world so your lost item shows up on a map even if it's miles away as long as another tracker user has wandered by it it's pretty cool basically the app records your lost items last known location on a map and if another tracker user comes within a 100 foot range of your item you'll receive a gps update of your item's location your phone can track up to 10 devices at once. It's Bluetooth low energy, so the battery lasts up to a year. They have water-resistant cases, uh, basically perfect for pet collars or if you're the kind of person that gets a little aggressive with the hose on the weekends. You can even add a laser engraved message to each tracker Bravo, like return or pet info. And I think I heard Ryan snickering in the background because he has a child, and child fluids get everywhere, even on trackers. It's pretty cool. The tracker Atlas works with your Tracker Bravo or third-party Bluetooth tracker to pinpoint your items on a customizable floor plan of your home. Never lose the thinking game with tracker people. It's time. The hardest thing you'll ever have to find is their website. It's a little confusing. The TheTrackR.com. T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com. Never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter in the promo code TWITCH, that's T-W-I-C-H, you'll get 30% off your entire order. That's big savings, people. T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R dot com. Use the promo code TWITCH for 30% off your entire tracker order and stop losing things and start living life. I'm just saying. <laughs> you lost your child yet, Ryan? No, I haven't lost a child, Good. but uh, when you're talking about having a four-year-old or whatever, lose, uh, take your keys and hide them, <clears throat> uh, I immediately was like, okay, well, my, my daughter can't walk yet, but she can crawl very quickly, and she definitely likes to pick things up and move them already, so uh, I, I see the value immediately. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. Um, how much would you expect to pay for a mechanical keyboard, Ryan? 
Oh, I don't know, eight dollars. Wow, dude. You can Start low. Ten cents a gig, eight dollar <laughs> keyboards. That's that's what we're talking about. It's all coming together for me now. Um, I cannot get you an eight dollar mechanical keyboard unless okay. we count uh, some of the keyboards, the Model M keyboards I bought back in the day at garage sales. All right. I'm just saying. But uh, if you're curious, we had a, a viewer ask us about this on the tech thing. And uh, essentially, this is the Fire Rose first player mechanical keyboard. It is essentially uh, a Tumo, which is a name I am butchering because it's enormously difficult because it's all vowels. Um, mm -hmm. A Tumo switches, which are essentially uh, cherry blue clones. And mm -hmm. uh, you won't be able to see it because the lights are on. But there's a giant rainbow from purple to red that comes across here. No, no key macros, no keys. It will use standard... Um, it will use standard cherry keycaps if you're the kind of person who likes to put custom keycaps on there. Um, not a bad deal for 45 bucks if you really want to have a mechanical Ooh. keyboard. Uh, it's also uh, 45 bucks on Amazon, 55, 50 to 55 bucks on Newegg. They claim it is completely waterproof. Um, there were some f sort of edge fit issues on the keyboard, so I did not feel like testing the waterproofiness of it. Um, but... Uh, Otherwise, the, the fit and finish is pretty solid. The keys felt a little sloppier than Cherry's, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, You said this was the you're... Fire Dancing? <laughs> the Fire Rose. The Fire First Rose. Player, okay. Fire okay. Rose mechanical keyboard. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about those, uh, according to the... Uh, um, um, according to a mass drop that uh, Otemo... Uh, uh, the the Temo switch company did their blue keys are are you know they're very clicky right so they have that that real loud uh, tactile response but they're 30 grams of pressure so like a four millimeter travel 2.3 millimeters mm -hmm. to actuate uh, very loud uh, but only 30 grams to travel so it's a very soft key like I think mm -hmm. a typical cherry uh, blue is rated at like 50 or 60 grams so if you are uh, if you are curious about the lightest feeling key ever, <laughs> this might be the one for you. Um, nice. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that in because it was it was so strange. That's cool. There's also some pretty amazing uh, membrane keyboard uh, mouse combinations on Amazon for a whopping twenty five dollars a pair. So nice. I'm gonna order those in to review it just because I can, people. <laughs> oh man, Red Devil. What's the story with the Power Color Radeon 4x 480 leak? It's so pretty. I mean, these two stories are are basically uh, similar. The Power Colors Retail RX 480 um, leaked out their Red Devils, kind of known as their higher end brand. Uh, you can tell. I mean, this this is a, a card that doesn't even have a back plate on it, uh, but it looks like it's going to have three Display Ports and HDMI and a DVI connection. So very similar to what Nvidia does on their Founders Edition cards. Um, Key here is it's it's a non-reference cooler, so it's a non-blower style style cooler, which will be quieter for most users that aren't in small form factor cases that uh, you don't have to worry about uh, heat kind of building up in one central location. Um, it also has an eight-pin power connection, apparently, as opposed to a six-pin power connection. So. Um, the picture doesn't really kind of tell you that because you can't see the connector, but that extra piece hanging off, maybe they were testing it in a six pin power driven mode. Um, but this is what's, what's what'll be interesting, right? If you look at this and then you look at the next card, the Asus uh, RX 480 Strix graphics card, right? Other than having all the LEDs that we're used to seeing on pretty much everything now, um, this one will apparently have an eight and a six pin power connector on it. Oh, wow. Which is way overkill i think um but i'll be curious like so all these are supposed to be custom pcb designs mm -hmm. so uh i will find out if they have any kind of similar problems to what the reference design of the rx480 had in terms of its power draw where it was drawing too much power through the pci express slot um then it should be now if you have an eight pin and especially if you have an eight pin and a six pin I would assume mm -hmm. that that means you're going to draw a lot more power through that pci express like the uh through that PCI Express uh, a power adapter as opposed to the motherboard slot itself. That would be my assumption. Uh, but obviously, we need to test and evaluate that specifically. Um, so I, I, I think it'll be interesting 
when when they come out. And obviously that's with all the controversy that surrounded the RX 480's power draw. Um, that's going to be one of the first things that people really look at and focus on uh, with any kind of non-reference designs when they finally come out. Because we haven't we actually since that since that week we really haven't seen RX 480's really come back in stock either. So uh, GTX 1080's, 1070's are not the only ones suffering from uh, lack of availability in the market. So. Uh, I didn't mean to suggest that, that either of those were available. We talked about this earlier. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just, I'm, I'm just curious now, like, if AMD maybe is holding off pushing out more reference cards in hopes that the that the retail custom builds come out and are and are better uh, reviewed more favorably. Uh, I don't know. I'm a little bit curious if there was expected to be this little inventory throughout the entirety uh, of the month of July, but we'll see. Um, I guess, and we've got 16 more days, 16 or 17 more days worth of July. So more to come. More to come. Dell's new 30 inch 4K, 120 Hertz, UP 3017 QL OLED monitor coming soon. I cannot wait to see this monitor. Um, Tim Vary's got a quick write up on uh, PCPro.com. Um, you know, 38. 40 by 2160 uh, resolution, obviously. Um, but OLED means, uh, you know, the 400,000 to one contrast ratio, which normally is a, a giant package of fluff that somebody makes up in the marketing department, could actually be uh, fairly legitimate. I exaggerate slightly, but essentially OLED means they get uh, true blacks. There have been, it's been interesting to, to talk to Robert Heron about some of the color issues on the OLED monitors uh, that are coming out on the HDTV side of things. Um, but uh, this should be pretty badass. 100% of the Adobe RGB and 97.8 of the DCI P3 color spaces, which means if you are a, a professional that works in graphics or video, this should be amazing. Um, you know, 1.7 billion, 1.07 billion colors. Um, they say they've mitigated burning on the monitor by implementing a quote pixel shifting algorithm, writes Mr. Barry, and then a sensor on the monitor that can detect when you're looking at it and turn it off when no one is watching anything on it, which creeps me out to no end. Um, HDMI 2.0, mini display port 1.2, and USB type C. Um, technically, uh, as hardware SP pointed out, HDMI 2.0 and DP 1.2 do not have enough bandwidth to support 3840 by 2160 at 120 hertz. Uh, you're going to need a USB Type-C connector and its DisplayPort alternate mode feature to do it, which is pretty crazy. Um, yeah. I'm pr I think I may have seen this at uh, CES this year or one of its cousins. This is a professional monitor, and the number I'm about to drop in front of you is going to make some of you vomit. Uh, it is so high. This is a $5,000 monitor. Um, but yeah, but this is also, <laughs> this is also a part of the world where if, if, you know, this is the, this is a monitor, the monitor that is designed to compete with people who are using monitors that cost 10 or $20,000. I gotcha. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, this is the one they were showing at the Dell booth, uh, the UP 3017Q. I saw this at the Dell booth at CES this year. Um, it is a pretty monitor, uh, and it is also designed for serious professionals that have all of the money. Uh, to spend on <laughs> well, you, you laugh, right? But, no, but, I, you're you know, right. You know, <laughs> you're you're working on a you know you're working on a half million dollar commercial. You know, a four five thousand dollar monitor may not be uh, particularly out mm. of control. I'm just saying, man. True. Uh, 3D Mark Time Spy looking at DX12 asynchronous compute performance. This was interesting, um, and you wrote the article, so I'm just going to stop speaking now. So uh, a, a new 3D Mark benchmark was released today. Uh, you can actually get it in the free version. You can download the demo of 3D Mark, and you can get uh, the ability to, to run the the standard benchmark on your system. Um, it is a DirectX 12 based benchmark, so it is not DX11 uh, ported over DX12. It's a DX12 native game engine that's running it. Uh, you'll probably, if you're familiar with 3D Mark, uh, you'll probably recognize a lot of the uh, game assets uh, uh, sprinkled throughout. And what's interesting about that is that graph, like they, they, they talk a lot about what the potential advantages are of DX12 for game developers. If you look at 3D Mark Firestrike and you see some of those numbers there and compare them to 3D Mark Time Spy, Firestrike is a DX11 based test, Time Spy is their DX12, and look at something like vertices, right? So um, you would see up to 3.9 million vertices per frame 
in uh, Fire Strike, but you see up to 40 million vertices per frame in Time Spy. You look at uh, tessellation patches, triangles, compute shader invocations, which are just shader calls, essentially, right? Um, you go from up to 8.1 million to 70 million shader calls per frame. Uh, and it's kind of crazy when you think about that, right? Uh, just in general, not just the numbers, but the 70 million little tiny programs are being called for every frame that gets rendered at, you know, 30 to 60 to 90 frames per second. Uh, it kind of helps put things in perspective in terms of how impressive games are in general. Um, the visuals in this are really impressive. If you have time to watch that video, uh, the 3D Mark Time Spy demo, the one that we're playing right now, uh, I recorded this. Uh, with two GTX 1080s running an SLI, it runs at 1440p uh, at 60 hertz, so you can kind of get uh, a, f a full look, a full look at that. It's it's neat looking uh, graphically as well as uh, uh, showing off some of the the capabilities of the platforms and stuff. From a performance standpoint, it's actually this is actually really cool. I see that. So you look through this disc and you can see back in time. It's really cool game mechanic, and I would like to see it in an actual game someday yeah. uh just as a side note um <laughs> performance wise what's most interesting to me is actually uh the second graph on that page because this game takes advantage of a lot of dx12 features one of them being asynchronous compute which is obviously gets a lot of attention these days um and they actually have a toggle for you to disable asynchronous compute in the game engine and run some tests so if you go down mm -hmm. to the second graph there um, you will see two sets of data for every video card. Um, uh, a little bit further down, yeah, the blue and the red. There you go. Um, you'll see like the GTX 1080 has a score of 6886 with async enabled and 6415 with async disabled, a difference of 6.8%. So essentially the GTX 1080 gets a 6.8% jump in performance thanks to asynchronous compute enabling. Uh, if you look at the AMD cards towards the bottom, you'll see the Fury X gets 12.9%, the R9 Nano gets 11%, and the RX 480 gets 8.5% just from enabling uh, asynchronous compute. So clearly, um, AMD is getting more benefit from asynchronous compute than NVIDIA, although there are a lot of people that still, you know, debate that Pascal, NVIDIA's Pascal architecture doesn't have asynchronous compute actually enabled, and clearly, you know, our 1080 and 70 numbers show that isn't, isn't the case. What is interesting is if you look up at the 980 and 970 results there, you will see that there is no difference between results with asynchronous on and off. Um, and in talking to NVIDIA, uh, they're basically saying that a asynchronous compute is not enabled on Maxwell-based hardware. Um, and I think it's been long enough now that if they were going to enable it, they would have enabled it by today, right? Um, because the uh, uh, 3D Mark Time Spy will be a benchmark that is kind of universally adopted across uh, reviewers and hardware vendors um, day one, and it will be there for multiple years probably. Um, so not seeing it here means it's probably just not going to happen. Um, now, that doesn't mean the performance drops when you enable asynchronous computer or anything. It just means you're not getting any of that extra edge out of it. So uh, the argument of is NVIDIA, um, do they tend to deprecate their own products quicker than everybody else? Um, do they, are, are, is it just the architecture wasn't built to handle it and maybe enabling it reduces performance somewhat and so they'd rather just not enable it at all in software. Um, that's probably a likely scenario as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting to see, this is our first instance where we've been able to like categorically say, here's performance in the same engine with async on and with async off and now we can see uh, what those differences are. And it clearly weighs more heavily uh, towards AMD's uh, Fiji and Polaris GPUs so far. This is, uh, it's a good week for AMD on benchmarking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can get the Doom Vulcan and the and the, uh, 3D Mark Time Spy. It definitely appears to, to be that way. I agree. Nice. Yay, AMD. Oh, my goodness. Um, Robert Jill Praxis, wet bench, test bench, case review. This is just the worst name. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah it's this is this is i'm i apologize to the to the 
to the people here. Maury's uh, got the write-up on this. Uh, if you've ever spent a lot of quality time benchmarking uh, products or pulling in and uh, pulling PCs apart or swapping boards out to test things, you know, from a real-world benchmarking standpoint, this is not an optimal situation because you're not going to get real-world uh, performance because there's <laughs> no box around the components. From making things easy to swap things in and out, this is a dream and a fairly stylish one at that. And because it's black and red, it'll match 80% of the motherboards being sold currently today uh, for enthusiasts. Um, it's pretty crazy. Uh, quick remove panels, uh, you know, a nice, easy to modify setup. It's crazy. If you start scrolling down, uh, I love the build they did with the water tank hanging off of the side. Um, you know, my yeah. cats would, would probably manage to completely clog that with cat fur in a matter of minutes because they're vile little creatures that can shed at will. <laughs> um, but it's pretty cool. PerformancePCs.com uh, is probably the only people selling it. It's $185, or you can get it directly from Primo Chill for $140 or $185, pardon me, uh, from PerformancePCs.com or Primo Chill. Um, Maury notes, and this is pretty serious because Maury's a, a, you know, uh, Maury doesn't, no, Maury doesn't, you know, Maury doesn't, uh, offer cautionary words often, uh, not that I know them that well, but quote, this kit is meant more for the more seasoned enthusiast only. Um, yeah. You know, it's steel, um, you know, it's solidly built, it's laser cut, it's easy to construct. Uh, you need to be careful because there's a possibility of electrical conduction between the surface mounted components because it's a steel structure. So, you know, be careful how you mount it, um, you know. There's no drive or power LEDs. There's no instructions for figuring out how to get the vandal switches or the push. Basically, those are, 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 are sort of public-facing, on-machine-safe uh, switches. Uh, for example, there's one in a, a case to me right, next to me right now. Um, there's no expansion parts like there were available for the original, for the original version of the wet bench. But, uh, um, you know, it's an 18-pound case. Uh, or platform. I'm not even sure what I would call this at this point. You know, you're going to, if you've never, if you're not familiar with building PCs, this could be a little emotionally traumatic to assemble the first time. Um, because yeah. there's just a lot of ways to route things. But um, it's got style and it makes it super easy to swap boards in and out. But uh, it's also not cheap at $185. I do like how they mount the radiator across the top. That was pretty cool. Yep. So it's it's a unique little uh, uh, a chassis, but yes, very specific, very niche user yeah. group. So you can be niche once in a while. Have you yeah. been playing Pokemon Go? I have to ask. <laughs> no, okay. no, I haven't. Uh, my wife has, she, and I didn't even know she knew what a Pokemon was. Uh, I just get a text She's while I'm out, and, it and and it's a picture of my daughter in a stroller with an augmented reality Pokemon next to her. Uh, and there, and she, my wife plays it off as my daughter is the one playing uh, Pokemon Go. But at one year and three weeks old, I don't think that's really, that's really accurate. So, why you be a hater, man? Just, <laughs> old what your wife's telling you here. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying. With that, ladies and gentlemen. We want to invite you, as always, to tweet us at Ryan Schrader, at Patrick Norton. We love your questions. We're going to try to pack a few into the show in the next couple of weeks because we haven't done any because there's been so much freaking news going on. Remember to back up regularly. Use two-factor authentication. And if someone calls you and says they're from Microsoft, don't give them your password. It's a lie. <laughs> PCPro.com is a place to find all Ryan Schrader's work. You can find me at techthing.com. We're talking about home theater here at abxl.com. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.